thank you very much for joining us here tonight in what we believe will be a very important 90 minute plus presentation and discussion regarding very serious issues that truly affect every one of us every day in one way or another. I have to begin by saying it's a true honor to be in one room with so many wonderful selfless people that devote and have devoted so many years of their lives to helping others and working to make so many people's lives much, much better every day. On behalf of all of us, thank you. I have said several times now, there are two types of leaders in this arena. First is the leader that identifies an issue and says, hey, how can I make this issue about me? And that's probably acceptable to some, and of course that's okay for some. Then there is the leader that works to identify a troubling issue, and from there they devote themselves, works to collaborate with others, to develop true strategies, to seek solutions, to truly make that problematic issue much better for as many people as possible using every single resource available. Ladies and gentlemen, I am no longer new at this, and I can say with 100% confidence that this room is packed with incredible leaders that devote their lives to making things much better for many people, and as many people as they possibly can every day. And tonight's Mental Health Symposium is a good example of the difference good people in helpful positions can make when they truly stand together to work towards a common, focused, tangible goal. I'd like to run through the purpose and importance of tonight's symposium. We've all gone to many assemblies, some of which were very, very good. However, to be honest with you, many of us unfortunately believe the day of the big assembly for parents is over and has been for a while. Society always changes, and just like any area of life or business, we have to keep up with the changes. We have to keep up with the models and trends, especially with our communication strategies. And that is truly what much of this comes down to, good, important communication strategies. The in-school assembly, for the students is very good and has always been an incredible vehicle, but too often with very little benefit to the parents and guardians. A typical scenario we are probably all too familiar with. So the day of the assembly, the student comes home. The parent says, hey, how was the assembly today? The student says, good. The parent says, hey, did you learn anything today at the assembly? No, not really. So too many times that is the extent of the knowledge that the parent ever gets from the important series of topics covered in that important information sharing assembly. I happen to know firsthand that our schools have and have had incredible programs for our youngsters. But if that material doesn't make it home to the parents or guardians, that is a serious missed opportunity to get a good understanding on what our child, their friends, or our family members might be facing, feeling, or thinking. That's where we began. About eight years ago, a few of us identified what we began to call the big disconnect. The question was, and still is, how can we as parents and guardians possibly be effective in a war against drugs and alcohol? How can we learn and understand more about mental health and the struggles that so many of us live with every day. We all acknowledge in almost every field that knowledge is power and to be effective or successful in anything, especially a war or a serious fight, you need knowledge, power, and as much as you can get your hands on. We as a group said to each other, we need to learn, we need to better understand we need to get our hands on the best information, the most accurate information, current and relevant information out there from the best sources and make it available to as many people as possible, especially the parents and guardians and in real time. We need to introduce people to these incredible resources and be prepared to share these resources ourselves if necessary through social media, websites, emails, and all of the communication vehicles we all use every day. 
We need to reach out to as many groups as possible, our community leaders, sports leagues, houses of worship, scout organizations, and ask them to please share this important information and these resources with their respective groups. And we also must continue to work very hard to build on our incredible relationships with our great school systems, and we do have great school systems. We need to contact and connect with the best and brightest people in these fields that we can. We must also commit and have that this type of initiative is not a one and done. We must continue to make it clear that we need help, our families need help, and most of all, we are no longer to accept that the way we have been doing things is enough. Ladies and gentlemen, this entire structure and serious need that I just discussed was the impetus for the creation of the New Jersey Coalition for Education and Positive Choices, which we now call NJC4 with four dashes next to it for mental health and wellness, addiction and available services, understanding and caring for our aging family members, education and positive choices. Tonight, what you will see and hear are incredible detailed presentations from the absolute top people in their fields on real everyday struggles. Explanations that will hopefully help us all better understand these very real struggles that too many of us are having to live with every day. And from there, you will see who to reach out to for very good guidance and help. Please know that every one of these professionals, elected or appointed officials in this room tonight, are available to you every single day. We spent quite a bit of time on programming, supporting programming, creating programming, and working with existing programs to make them even better, if we can. We have made it very clear right from the get-go that not every student is an honorable student or a varsity athlete. And to be honest with you, most students are not. Does that mean those children have any less value? No, absolutely not. But for that short section of their lives, too many youngsters actually do feel less valuable. And that is not OK. We work as a group with an incredible network and have worked very hard to create new strategies to introduce all of our youngsters to activities that they may not have been ordinarily introduced to so far. We created partnerships with many martial arts studios, dance studios, fitness centers, and we created Morris County's Friday nights at Menon Arena, which is 10 consecutive Friday nights every winter. You will hear much more about these programs and many, many more from our very own Hanover Township Superintendent of Recreation, Denise Brennan, shortly. We created countless music programs. Just prior to the big COVID-19 lockdowns, we established a full music and arts division, which we will be relaunching shortly. The, the underlining goal of our programs and much of our work is if a youngster can truly find their passion, develop more confidence, self-respect, or maybe even experience self-respect for the first time, from there they are absolutely much more likely to carry that self-confidence and feeling of self-worth for the rest of their lives. An ancillary benefit may likely be meeting other youngsters with similar passions. From there, that is where true relationships can begin and begin to be built that can last a lifetime. Self-confidence and the feeling of self-worth is absolutely a major piece to anyone truly feeling at peace with themselves. And we all know when someone respects themselves, they are much more likely to respect others, which is a beautiful thing, and in my opinion, we need much more of in this world today. Thank you very much, and now we will begin. But how's everybody doing tonight? And I want to begin by saying thank you very much for being here. It's an honor to be sitting here with this panel, and I personally know just about everybody in this audience, and I appreciate everybody fighting a good fight, and fighting a good fight almost every day, so thank you, everybody. It's an honor. To begin, I would like to ask Senator Panaccio and our dear friend, Hanover Township Business Administrator, Joseph Giorgio, 
to please come up and lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. And if you would, Senator, please make a few comments. Yes, come up. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Senator. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Mayor, and good evening to everybody. Uh, when the mayor had asked me to say a few words, you know, it's like politicians, everyone thinks you have a button in your back, you just press the button and you have some type of canned speech. I know uh, Lincoln happened to do it in Gettysburg, but Lincoln did not do that extemporaneously. Lincoln studied that speech over and over again. But I'm going to speak to you very briefly for no more than a minute or two off, you know, from my heart. Um, the only thing I can tell you is just from personal experience, uh, I'm a dentist, uh, was trained in the sciences. Uh, when we talk about dentistry, when we talk about medicine, when we talk about pathology, we're able to put a finger on it. We could show you where the disease is. If there's a boil, we could lance it. Um, if there's a, a golf bit of cancer, we could do a CAT scan. There are tests that we can quantify with what's going on. Unfortunately, all too often, if not most of the times, with mental illness, there isn't that test. There isn't that thing that you can point to somebody, yet the results are no less devastating. And in some, some senses, actually, it's, it's worse because, uh, because you can't grasp, uh, uh, can't grasp it on what the disease is and show somebody what it is. Sometimes those people that are suffering the most get ostracized. So we have to have compassion with them. I can tell you from personal experience, and I don't think there's a family here or anywhere that has not been affected and has been afflicted by some type of me mental uh, illness. Uh, growing up and 68 years later, there's still things in my mind that were horrific that I will never, ever forget. But having said that, at least we can take those past experiences and now I can apply them to my public service and when it comes to issues that are important to people in this room, hopefully I can bring those past experiences and also try to see if we can change some of those things. Nobody's immune. Uh, if you talked about Abraham Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln, uh, they, they said he had the hypos, uh, which meant that he had severe depression. His, uh, his um, true love of his life, not Mary Todd, Aunt Rutledge had died, and they had to take sharp instruments away from him because they were afraid he was going to commit suicide. They said, uh, you know, he doesn't want to visit the grave of, of Anne, he said, because it, it breaks his heart to think that raindrops were actually falling on top of her grave. And then to make matters worse, he goes and he marries Mary Todd, and that's a whole other story. But um, again, those experiences that we have, and knowing that it affects everybody, um, we take those experiences with us, and hopefully we can help everybody going forward with some good, solid public policy. So thank you all tonight for joining us in, and hopefully I'll learn a few things myself. God bless you all. Okay, a dear friend of ours, Pastor Vernon Outlaw, he's going to lead us in a prayer, and he's going to have a few comments for us also. Dedicated public servant, does quite a bit in the field that we're discussing tonight. Pastor, please take the floor. Yes, Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for divine opportunity. We thank you, Lord, for this gathering of folks that are not only aware, folks that are not only committed, but folks who are looking at what is a tremendously difficult situation and looking at it with the eyes of hope. We thank you, Lord, for this gathering, for all that are here, for all who are committed to the cause. And we thank you, Lord, that in your word that you say that if we lack wisdom, that we can ask for it, and you give it to us freely and without reproach. And so as we begin this meeting, and as there are so many resources available, we ask for divine wisdom, Lord, for your guidance for each and every one. Uh, we don't want to just uh, put efforts forward in a lot of different directions, Lord, but we want to join together in an effort that is about 
finding answers, solutions, and providing them to those who are in need. So we ask for your direction, ask that you guide steps, guide uh, ideas, uh, guide the gathering together of each and every person in this room so that at the end of the day there is a unit that's moving towards the same cause, which we know will bring you glory. We thank you and bless you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 <coughs> thank you, Mayor, and to all the elected officials, everyone here representing all the various agencies. Just want to thank the Mayor for the opportunity just to uh, make a few comments. Um, as a pastor, I send and bring uh, regards from our senior pastor, Pastor Donnie Rosa. Um, as a pastor, we're called in um, to assist in providing care for people across a number of different areas. Um, frequently, we're called in when there are issues of health, hospital visits, visits at home, caring for people who have physical needs is a part of, of what we do, part of what we engage in. And as a pastor, I can tell you that, you know, we who, who believe, believe that there are answers for everything, that God's provided answers for everything, and we bring that uh, perspective of hope wherever we go. Um, but I have to say to you that as a pastor that there's not a lot of areas that are perhaps as challenging as this one and for all the reasons that the senator mentioned because there isn't really a, you know, it's that or it's this. Uh, and because people are not accustomed to dealing with things where there are no answers, quite frankly, um, even in the work that we do, um, it's tremendously difficult. And I'll just say, and I think everyone in the room can uh, attest to this, that in some way, um, I mean, the reason why we're here is because we feel like not enough has been done and we want to make sure that more is getting done. I think that for us, even in what we do, there's a sense that even historically that we haven't been really great about handling mental health, mostly because people didn't know what to call it, didn't know what to do uh, about it, and as a result, many times the kind of care that even we would want to provide uh, would fall short. Um, we have, uh, in our church, um, uh, made it a point uh, to acknowledge the fact that we've been challenged, uh, acknowledge the fact that the resources that we would even want to provide, that we haven't had them all, uh, and acknowledge the fact that we're going to make it our purpose to be engaged in discussions like this, to be engaged in uh, providing resources, uh, a venue where resources can come together uh, across a number of fronts with uh, very good friends, including the folks from the Mental Health Association. Uh, we've come to learn so much more about what we didn't know uh, and also to make folks in our congregation aware, provide resources to them, and really just are looking uh, as we go on to be those who uh, would be considered a resource. And so I thank you for the opportunity just to make some comments. What you're doing um, is such a necessary work um, and I think the thing that I, I, I learned along the way is, is that oftentimes with things like this, people are, wor are, are working and they're working in a thousand different directions at the same time. And everyone has a heart to do the right thing. But it's only when all those resources come together and start sharing resources with one another, sharing understanding with one another, <coughs> understanding that why have five different agencies working on the same thing when they could be collectively working on a bigger something with each providing a piece uh, to the puzzle. Uh, I think it's that kind of collaboration that is the essence of why you're together. And I'm just so blessed to have an opportunity to have some comments and to be a part of it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> And now I would be honored to introduce our panel. 
starting with a very, very important part of our municipal family, Kathy Whitehead. Thank you. If you'd like to say a word or two before we uh, start the program, this is your time. Okay, I'm Kathy Whitehead. I'm the public health nurse here in Hanover Township. Lucy, <coughs> Lucy, Lucy Deutsch. I'm Lucy Deutsch. I'm a retired geriatric care manager. I have had a passion for older folks, one of which I am these days, all my life. And so my work has been a labor of love, and I'm happy to share what I can this evening. I very much appreciate having been invited. Thank you, Mayor Gallagher. Thank you, Lucy. Chief Jack. Chief Jack Ambrose, the Morris County Sheriff's Office Patrol Division. Um, just imagine a collection of public servants who checked their party affiliation at the door just to help people. That's what this is all about. You have an abundance of resources. Now it's up to everybody else to get that message out that help is available. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. And a dear friend of ours and a very important part of our team is Mayor Garrity, Marstown Mayor. Mayor? Well, let me, let me just say a couple of things. And one is let me thank Mayor Gallagher for including Marstown, myself. And I want to recognize my vice president of my council who's here with his wife, Jessica. Because um, we, we and as their parents, and this is important. And I thought it was important that they experience what what, what I'm about to experience the first time. Um, I just want to put it on on record um, that reaching across the aisle and reaching out to other communities, as you have done more than once, is really something that that we have lacked, and um, we, we are very <coughs> grateful for your leadership and uh, this important issue of mental health isn't just one community it stretches over every community um, and uh, and I'm really looking forward to hearing the professionals and being part of this I, I really want to thank you publicly and uh, and I'm, I'm happy to be here thank, thank you. you very much mayor yeah. I think everybody in this room knows our dear brother mayor Joseph Padula from East Hanover mayor Joe thank you Ace so I'll stand up so you can see. <laughs> <laughs> so from the bottom of my heart, there is nothing more important to each and every one of us that are here today to make a difference. And that difference will come from us and from you. Everyone here is a dedicated public servant. i just tell you a quick <coughs> phrase when I told my dad about 25 years ago when he was with us on earth and I was blessed to have him with me for all of those years that I told him I was going to run for public office. <laughs> Boy, if you should hear my father, what he said to me, he said to me, Joe, he used to call me Joey. I said, Joe, why would you do that? Anybody I know that was in public office is not a good person. He said, I sent you to good schools. We raised you to be a good person. And I said, Dad, what you know is different as an immigrant. We will, I will, on your behalf and on everybody else's behalf in this room, we will make a difference. We can change what has happened. Anyone in this room, you, you have to agree that <coughs> what's happening to our country right now is wrong. And we can make a difference. And I promise you that everybody up on this panel that I've got to know personally is doing that, making a difference. And I am honored and humble. So Ace and I go back a long time. Many, many years ago, Ace as a young boy came down and East Hanover, he's an East Hanover boy. That's why I love him even more. <laughs> he uh, offered to help when I was organizing many years ago girls softball. And Ace came forward and said, again, I was no, I was a mayor, no mayor. I was a working stiff, working in the sheriff's department, uh, working my way up the ladder. Ace came, helped from nothing, 278 girls. And today, what's more important to me than anything is making that difference with everybody else in this room. Mental health is a huge issue. Drugs are a huge issue. If we don't take that step forward, we are doing a, a 
big mistake for our country that we all love so dearly. And again, let me shut up because I could go on for two hours. Uh, we will make a difference, I promise you that. I promise you that we're not gonna let this fall through the cracks. And may God bless each and every one of us in this room. God bless. It's an honor to introduce Florham Park Mayor Mark Taylor, a very, very important part of our coalition and many, many other initiatives that we participate in. Mayor Taylor. Thank, thank you. you so much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I think the real heroes are out in the audience tonight. Three of our superintendents are here tonight, and I think we should give them a big round of applause. <laughs> For they hold our children's future in their hand those teachers, those principals, all those that are bringing our children up are you know, the lifeblood of what goes on. We all in this room have a family member, a friend, a relative, whatever, that has suffered from mental health, uh, from drug addiction, and or from uh, uh, alcoholism. So I think that everyone can stand beside themselves here this evening to say that we're all here to help. We're all here to offer some sort of uh, recognition to those that are suffering and give them a way to uh, get treatment, to help them with uh, some of the, the people that are really in charge of, uh, of the destiny of where they need to go to go forward. And I'm, I'm pleased, pleasured to be here this evening. Uh, Ace and I, I think we started this uh, back eight years ago from the station wagon that we owned at that time. Mm -hmm. and, you know, going school to school and growing this. Um, we've had some great meetings in, in all the towns around, and we plan on growing this uh, venture throughout the county and beyond <coughs> if necessary to help those who need help and to uh, recognize problems before they become serious. And uh, I would just like to say I'm pleased and honored to be here on the dais this evening. Thank you. Morris Plains Mayor Jason Carr. So it's certainly a pleasure to be here, uh, up here on stage or the dais with, with everybody who honestly, truly cares. Um, we take our time. We don't get paid for what we do, Lord knows, but we're here because we do care. And to have this assembly of these great people, the professionals and everything else that are here to just offer help, let everybody know what's out there is so important. Like Mayor Taylor said, everybody here has been touched in one way or another by mental health or, or, or addiction. And just getting that information out, I, I don't know anybody or any other group in, in Morris County at least that, that is uh, formed and, and putting this all out there. So uh, I'm proud to be here. Um, my police chief, Mike Karaski, is here also uh, from Morris Plains. I thank you for showing up, Mike, and uh, uh, he'll get this message out. And I, I, I really look forward to seeing this message grow uh, throughout the county, throughout the state, and throughout the nation. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. One thing I do have, I forgot, is I just have a quote by Mark Twain, and it's, Give every day the chance to become the most beautiful of your life. The next gentleman is Commissioner Steve Shaw. And I always say this because Steve is a general, but Steve is a soldier. Steve is involved in just about everything we do, and he's not involved in name only. He works very, very hard. And Commissioner, it's an honor to be sitting up here with you on this dais, and if you want to say a few words before we move on. Thank you very much, Mayor. Um, most people probably don't know what a county commissioner is. We used to be called freeholders, but that changed, so at least I don't have to listen to the free freeloader jokes anymore. <laughs> um, but I really want to thank you and commend you for putting this, uh, this group together. You, you learn something very quickly. It's really in life, but especially in public life. You can't do anything by yourself. You need to form partnerships. You need to work with people. Um, and especially when it comes to these issues of mental health, substance abuse, aging, I mean, everything we're going to be talking about tonight, it doesn't know political boundaries. It doesn't know geographic boundaries. It doesn't know socioeconomic status. It touches everybody. And that's why we all need to be here working together. And I think sometimes, coming from a, a county like Morris County, one of the 10 wealthiest in the United States, people don't think we have issues like that here in Morris County. But we do. I mean, don't get me wrong. It's a great county, but everybody is touched you know, by these issues. And the county works very, very hard in helping and working and forming partnerships to address it. And 
I'm one of those people, I still get the print copy of the daily record. This is the title just from the other day, Teen Mental Health Cases Surge. And there's a quote from a girl here, um, the system wasn't at all that great when I was in crisis as a teenager. The backstory, she tried to commit suicide several, several times. Um, she's now 24. It showed me how much everyone needs to be better educated on recognizing and dealing with these issues. And that's, you know, that's what we're here for tonight. And um, I know you're going to learn more about uh, what our sheriff is doing with Hope One and navigating Hope. But I just have to tell a personal story. Um, when I first decided to run, it was Freeholder at the time. You have to raise money. I was having a fundraiser, and a neighbor of mine from about 15 years ago in Rockaway Township, I was living in, in live in Mountain Lakes now, showed up at this party, and I noticed that halfway through the evening, he's in the corner talking to the sheriff for a long time. And I didn't really know what was going on. I didn't get a chance to talk to the sheriff, but my neighbor from 15 years ago called me the next morning, and he said, Steve, I'm so glad I decided to come by and support you because our daughter, who I knew as a little six-year-old when we were neighbors, she's had serious problems and the sheriff got her help the night of your party. And he said, he saved her life. And I said to my wife that night, the next day when I learned this story, I said, you know what, it doesn't matter whether I win this election or not, the fact that I was able to connect those two people, that's all that really matters. And, and that was true and that is the way uh, the sheriff operates and everybody in the county uh, working on these issues and there's a, there's a lot of folks out there and there's a lot of programs and I'm going to just, the, the, the sheriff said something the other day when he was giving a talk about the sheriff services, a lot of the focus was on Hope One and Navigating Hope and he said, because I downloaded all this information and all these services, but I would bore you. But the bottom line is, and this stuck with me, and it's so true. He said, if you want help, we will get you help. So that's, you know, that's two sentences, I guess. So just remember that, um, and, and that help is available here in Morris County. Thank you. The next panelist is a, a lady that is, has become very, very important to all of us, many, many of our families and friends, and it's an honor to be here with you. And Tracy, I know you have a lot of really serious material to cover and very shortly, but if you'd just like to introduce yourself and say a few words now, that'd be great. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Gallagher. I'm honored to be here today. My colleague will not only is a mental health professional, but also a parent and she will be discussing with you um, what to look for in your child. Because like the mayor was saying, you know, our kids come home from school and we say, how was your day? And they say, fine. Um, but sometimes, you know, especially when our youth are struggling, we focus on the behavior and not why the behavior is happening. Um, so tonight we're gonna be going over what you might notice in your child um, that could really be the signs that they might be struggling with anxiety or depression <clears throat> or even suicide and how to have that conversation because even if we may see something well once we see it how do we talk about it so that's what we're going to be going over tonight so thank you again thank you Tracy. and the last panelist before we have two special guests make a comment and then we're going to get right into it, is Denise Brennan, our Hanover Township Superintendent of Recreation and a very, very special person to us and all our families. Denise Brennan. Oh, thank you, Mayor. Um, well, I began my career in recreation 25 years ago as a part-time rec director in Mountain Lakes, and Commissioner Steve Shaw was my mayor. And I started in recreation uh, in a selfish way. I had five kids, and I needed those kids to do something. I had to find something for them to do. I was going crazy. But I came to love it. I love recreation. I love the power of play. I love the joy of companionship. And I love the opportunity to explore new things that recreation brings to every resident, whether they're five or 95. And uh, I think that's a little bit of what we're going to talk about tonight, about making connections and making things happen in a positive way. Thank you. Thank you, Denise. Now, before we begin, I'm not going to make it a point to thank the dignitaries, because as Mayor Taylor said, everybody in here tonight, in our opinion, is a dignitary. 
We're parents. We're people that can affect and impact children and families in a very, very good way. But I'd like to ask for two comments, and then we're going to jump right into it. Chief Jack, a dear friend of all of ours, a little while ago, referred to that there's no political aisle in this room. We're people, we're parents, we're friends, and, and a lot of us have true, very, very long, deep relationships. Um, but there's a gentleman that's on the radio every morning that talks about mental health and a lot of other issues that are important to us. And if we're talking about getting the word out and not talking about a specific agenda we have, but the phone numbers and the people and the experts and who to call if you have a crisis at 2 o'clock in the morning. Uh, I don't think there's anybody better than New Jersey 101.5, Bill Spadia. And Bill, if you'd like to take the floor and just say, make a few comments, we'd appreciate it. Thank you, thank you Mayor Gallagher. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, I have to tell you, I want to thank our elected officials who are here, Mayor Darty. Thank you, um, you know, Mayor Panulo, Mayor, Mayor Gallagher, Mayor Taylor, Mayor Carr and Commissioner Shaw, uh, to see these elected officials here, Chief, you said it best. It doesn't matter who you vote for. It doesn't matter who you love. It doesn't matter the color of your skin. We're all human beings trying to get through life. And, uh, you know, we've spent a lot of time, I mean, every one of us has been affected by family members, friends, depression, suicide, alcoholism, drug addiction. I am no expert. But I'm somebody who loves my family, my friends, my community, my state, my country, and we are in a true crisis. And I will tell you, we spent a lot of time in the last 10 years, I've been on the air, TV and radio the last eight years, and just in my travels and politics and media, um, you know, and just in family interactions, one thing that you know is that nobody is equipped to do this journey completely alone. We are social beings. And you know, when I was a kid, they talked about how if somebody was talking about suicide, they would never do it. Remember that? They talked about that, they would never do it. Now we know these are signs that we need to be aware of. And we've spent a lot of times, so I work a lot with a group called CFC Loud and Clear. We do a lot of work with Sheriff Gannon, Hope One, just promoting and using the power of the radio, largest audience in the state, to say, guys, you've got to recognize these signs that we are all actually in this together. And one of the messages that I talk about often, and I won't take a lot of time here, I know, you know, you give me a microphone and I could just keep going, so I'm not going to do that. Um, but, but, I, but I do have a message that I really think hopefully will hit home. That we talk about awareness, and there are a lot of groups out there that say, hey, we've got to have awareness. We're going to wear a certain band and a color and this. The reality is we are all aware that there's a crisis. What we need is action. What Hope One is doing is action. What these mayors are doing is action. And action means intervening. So I work with a group called CFC Loud and Clear, work with a group called the Nicholas Hudanish Foundation, all started by families who lost someone to suicide or addiction, whether it was drugs or alcohol. And it's all about coming together to say, how do you hit this problem before it becomes a crisis? You know, I'm old enough to remember there were two words that we learned as kids. Some of you are as old as I am, some older, some younger. The two words were winners and losers. And we don't hear those words enough among our young people today. And what's happened is we've had two generations of kids that have not been equipped with the skills to overcome adversity, to understand how to deal with failure, how to deal with something that simply doesn't go your way. And I give this speech over and over again. I'm speaking almost once a week at organizations like this to say we have to get back to the basics. By the time your kid is 16, 17, 18 years old, you're in trouble at this point. Because what they're doing is they're turning to bad influences, whether it's drugs, alcohol, or peers who have already gone off the track. And they're getting bad advice. And the disconnect between parents and their kids. And we've got a lot of problems in our political world, a lot that have been created by both parties. But the bottom line is that until we can get to our children and get them to understand that life is hard. Life is not, hey, there's something wrong. There's a pill for that. There's something wrong. There's an app for that. There's something wrong. Don't worry. You're OK. I gave this speech to a group of parents the other day. I said, you know, 
when your kid gives up 10 goals, he should not be the goaltender. And they reacted saying, wait a minute. I'm like, we need a little bit of tough love when it comes to our young people because if they can't handle the real world, they will turn to the worst demons that are out there. And we as a community, we as a society, we as moms and dads and leaders, whether we're faith leaders or political leaders or a guy on the radio, I think we have an obligation to tell kids, life is hard, but you matter and you can overcome all of these obstacles. And one story that I share, and I'll leave you with this, uh, my good friend Daniel Regan, he is the founder of CFC Loud and Clear. This is a recovery group that we, uh, we do work with across the state. And he was in rehab seven times, failed seven times. Finally, his mom found him early 20s and chased him across the country, found him homeless and drugged up in an abandoned hotel in California and was able to save his life. Partly because the state of California recognizes that some adult children are not capable of making sound decisions and she was able to make a decision to get him into a program. But that's a political policy issue that I think the state needs to address, but that's more down the road. But the important thing was that Daniel Regan mattered. He mattered to two people that he had never met. Daniel Regan went through seven rehabs, got out of recovery, has now been sober for 12 years, is married with two children. And he and I have had these conversations. I say, you know, you had no idea that the two people you mattered to had not been born yet. And that to me is a message that we need to send to people that there is a future. That future can be anything you want, but you've got to be able to overcome the adversity and you're not alone. We are actually in this together. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, all our guests. <laughs> appreciate you being here. Thank you. Thank you. Before we begin, and I know she's going to uh, be surprised, and I hope pleasantly, but in addition to Senator Pinaccio, in the last 10 to 12 months, um, Kelly Duchette from Mikey Sherrill's office has become a very important part of our regional family. Uh, and my, uh, Kelly and Senator Joe changed quite a bit for us and with us. So Kelly, if you would like to get up and say hello and say a few words, and Senator Panaccio, you can always take the microphone when you're with us because you are our brother and we're honored to have you here too. But Kelly and Senator Joe, if you want to kick it off, we're going to go right into our program after that. Well, thank you very much for that, and I don't want to get in the way of getting to our experts here, who I know have really amazing um, information to share with everybody. Um, but I just am really happy to be here on behalf of the Congresswoman who's down in Washington today, and she wanted to pass on my thanks to everybody for gathering uh, today to have this really important conversation. Um, it is an issue that's very important to her, and um, just to pass on if anybody has ideas for legislation or funding that we can help bring back to the district um, around mental health and substance abuse uh, disorders, uh, please contact our office. We always want to hear from everybody who's doing this work on the ground. Uh, but most importantly, we want to thank you not only for coming together to share resources and to gather the community, but it is just so important to be make it okay to talk about this topic and for people to be able to understand and destigmatize um, mental health. I know I've dealt with it in my own family, and one of the things I was most grateful for was that my family member was able to come to me and tell me that they were having an issue, and it was because of forums like this and resources like this that are up here. So thank you so much to all of you. Um, you have an amazing group of mayors up here um, and public servants who come together on all these really important issues, and, and it's just a really important part of our community. And like I said, the Congresswoman wanted me to pass on her thanks, and, and I uh, thank you as well from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. Senator Joe, are we ready to go? Okay. <laughs> and thank you, everybody. And you know, there are a lot of very, very important part, uh, a lot of important people in this room that are part of our our solution. And throughout the night, we will acknowledge and thank everybody for being here. But of course, we don't want to miss out on anybody. But I will say, our next symposium is going to be in East Hanover, hosted by our dear brothers and sisters from East Hanover and Mayor Panula. So I'm going to. Uh, Ask Mayor Taylor to please introduce our beginning of our program with the Mental Health Asso Association. Mayor Taylor, please. Yes, I'd like to introduce uh, Tracy Capicelli, 
Uh, I just looking at their website, I just like to read their, their mission. <coughs> the mission of the Mental Health Association is provide, I'm sorry, promote mental health with the integration of physical health care to improve the care and treatment of individuals with mental illness and to remove the stigma associated with mental health disorders and addictions. As a community organization, we accomplish our mission through advocacy, education, prevention, early intervention, and treatment and service. I think that says it all for what they do, but the personalities that are here this evening that will explain it in depth are amazing. I've listened to Tracy and Jolene, and I have not listened to Jonathan yet, but I look forward to it this evening. Uh, go on about the services that are available, the phone numbers that are available, and all of the things that were available to all of our folks that are here and, and beyond. So Tracy, please introduce your team. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mayor. So this is Jolene Windsor. You could stand up. <laughs> Jonathan couldn't be here today. He actually just got into a car accident on his way here, but thank God oh. he's okay. Um, should Jolene go to the podium? Should yeah, whatever you would like. Oh, podium be great. Your podium would be here. Oh, perfect. Yes. So um, <clears throat> one of the programs that we actually just started at the Mental Health Association when Jolene gets ready. Um, is we just received funding from the state. So the state realized, along with this group here, that our youth are in a mental health crisis. Um, so the Department of Children and Families launched a program September 1st called NJ4S, which stands for the New Jersey Statewide Student Support Services Program, which provides prevention services in schools, and it also provides intervention services in schools. So we provide education to students, to parents, um, and then we provide short-term counseling for youth until they could get connected to services in the community. So if we could help them before they get to that crisis point. So again, Jolene is gonna be talking about um, what you can look for in youth as far as maybe if they're struggling with depression, <clears throat> excuse me, anxiety or suicide and how to start that conversation because again sometimes that can be one of the hardest pieces to do especially for a parent thank you Tracy and uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here to this uh, discuss this very important topic of what we need to know Can about you just the put the mic a bit. great thank you Is that better yep. yes uh, about depression anxiety and suicide um, and what we do when we see signs in ourselves and how to help those around us. Great. Um, mental health versus mental illness. There's many things we could do to take care of our mental health and it's a very personal experience and I'll be talking about that throughout the presentation. Um, what works for one person may look very different for another person and that's okay. Um, there's ways we could protect our emotional health, our psychological health, our social well-being and that's all part of mental health. Um, mental illness, there's serious conditions, whether it be suicide ideation or anxiety disorders, depression, um, and it's when it starts to affect every area of our life and we have trouble coping that we should really destigmatize seeking help in some way. We all feel stress. That's normal. It's nothing to be ashamed of. It's part of our lives. Um, if we don't know how to deal with that stress, that stress may turn into anxiety, which may surface as panic attacks. Um, this may linger after our stress even resolves. So it's wonderful to learn our own um, successful coping strategies to avoid our stress from hanging around for too long. How to reduce stress. There's a lot of ways. Some of the most basic, get enough sleep. It sounds so simple, but sometimes it's very difficult. Eat well, treat ourselves well, move our bodies around, exercise, go for a walk. I know we've heard all of these before, but they really are so important. Um, seek emotional support. Avoid those harmful coping mechanisms. Um, we were talking about drugs and alcohol before. It may take the edge off to go home after a stressful day and have a drink, but we need to know how to actually cope with the issue if we are going to resolve it. And I always notice that number nine says ask for help. 
But I think it's important to point out we don't have to go through <coughs> steps one through eight before we decide to ask for help. Help is always available, and we need to destigmatize seeking it out because there is help available. Signs and symptoms of anxiety. As I mentioned before, it's very rarely is mental health and its treatment and coping skills a one-size-fits-all approach, and that goes for anxiety. Um, some people may just feel a little nervous, a little anxious, maybe your hands get cold or warm, you're a little shaky. Some people may feel as if they're having a heart attack. They may feel as if they're going to pass out. Um, and these can change with situations and with time. So it can be helpful to be aware of your triggers and the symptoms that manifest so that you can make a plan before it gets um, to a point where you're having trouble coping. What's the difference between sadness and depression? Sadness is a human emotion. We feel it um, for a variety of reasons. Usually though, sadness leaves. We experience something that makes us sad and then we're on to our normal lives and we can cope. It's when it lingers, especially for two weeks or longer, and we're really having trouble coping in our everyday lives, that we should probably think about seeking treatment. And the thing about any kind of mental illness, one of um, the ways they're diagnosed is, well, are you having trouble coping in your normal everyday life? And if you're not, that's a good sign that it's time to seek some help. Signs of depression. We may see these in others around us. We may notice these in ourselves. Again, they're not the same for everyone, but they will affect your daily life. It will be harder to cope um, with socializing. You may not want to socialize anymore. Moods may be very different. Um, you may have physical manifestations such as getting sick more often or headaches. There could be weight changes or even just moving slower. If you notice something is very off in someone you love, ask. Tips for talking to teens. We know this could be hard to get your teens to talk to you. Again, I keep stressing, this is not a one-size-fits-all approach. There are several um, ideas on this slide. It doesn't necessarily mean that they will all work for your teen. Knowing your child or knowing your niece or nephew or your cousin, it really goes a long way. What do they enjoy? Um, for instance, if you've never played a board game with your teen before, perhaps it's not the best choice to get them to start talking about their mental health. Um, but if it's something that they enjoy, it could really open the door for great conversation. Or continuing the conversation, having multiple mini conversations. Um, I have a almost 14 year old child and I know when I bombard him with questions, the wall immediately goes up. Like, mom, please, like not right now. So if maybe we go about it and just ask questions here and there, rather than expecting a 30, 40 minute conversation with an <coughs> adolescent, we may really start to get places. How to help your friend. Knowing your friend. And some of these uh, slides are aimed at adolescents looking to help their friend. Some are aimed at parents, educators. But we could really make them our own for any situation. Um, you don't need to have the answers. That's very important. If you approach someone that you love because you see that their personality has changed and you're worried about them being suicidal or depressed, it doesn't mean you know how to fix their problem. Um, but they know now that someone is there. They have some kind of support. And it's very easy to forget that there are people who care for you when you're feeling such a way. Um, and stick through them, stick with them through the hard times. I've mentioned in the last presentation, um, if you're going to ask, please be willing to listen because that is so important um, to ask and say, are you okay? And you hear, no, actually, no, I'm not. And then to be shut down, please be willing to listen if you're going to inquire. It could be so helpful. And whatever gets you talking, um, here's some tips. And this could be used if you want to talk to a friend or an adult, uh, an adolescent, your child. Seems like something's up with you or I've noticed you've been down lately. Very simply, are you okay? Um, no matter what you're going through, I'm here for you. T 
to let someone know that you're here to support them when they may be going through a harder time than we imagine could really go a long way. It could save a life, potentially. How to help. Again, ask, but be ready to listen. Give them the time that they need to really feel safe and to open up to you about what they're experiencing. Um, cut them some slack if you're met with some resistance. Um, they may feel uncomfortable or ashamed because of the stigma in the society for having these feelings. You know, are you okay? You've seen down. No, I'm fine. I, I don't want to talk about it. Don't give up on them. Maybe think of another way to come back to that at another time um, because they'll still know that you offered your support. Um, encourage, uh, encourage supportive relationships that may be with people besides yourself um, if there's siblings, other family members that the person is close to. That could all be helpful. And how do you even begin to know how to ask for help? Um, and this could be for ourselves again. We could be talking about help if we need it or how to get someone help that we love. Um, there's no reason why you should be afraid to speak up because there is help out there. But we know that there's great stigma that we're all working to reduce um, about asking for help. I feel like progress is being made there. But it's so important to know that help is there. If we reach out, help is there. And be gentle with yourself. We don't always feel our best all the time. And that's acceptable. Um, and that's hard for us to, to see in ourselves. However, a good question to ask if you're feeling this way is, well, what would you say to a friend if they were feeling this way? And odds are you wouldn't talk to them perhaps the way you talk to yourself and say, well, just get over it. It's not a big deal. You would be a lot more sympathetic, I'm guessing. Um, stay connected. Don't lose contact with the people who are supportive with you because you're feeling so down. And please set up an appointment with a professional, again, if these symptoms are truly interrupting your daily lives and you just can't seem to get on top of them. There's a lot of statistics up here, but what they all say is suicide is a crisis situation. It is a major issue. Um, at the top of the slide, we see that suicide is the second leading cause of death among people ages 10 to 24, the second leading cause of death. This is certainly a crisis that needs attention. In New Jersey, suicide is the third leading cause of death among teens. And Morris County, where we are, is not immune to that. We see up um, on the screen, maybe is it the fourth slide down, there's been 19 suicides in Morris County since the beginning of 2023. That number may be greater now. I don't have that information. But as of a few months ago, there was at least 19. Um, and further down the bottom of the slide, more youth die from suicide than from cancer, heart disease, AIDS, birth defects, stroke, pneumonia, influenza, and chronic lung disease combined. So again, this is a crisis that certainly needs attention. We see a chart on this slide. Um, this is by gender ages 10 to 24. I don't know if you can see, but the yellow bars represent females age uh, 10 to 24. The blue, uh, the blue bars represent males from ages 10 to 24. And these are suicide rates. We see that males are at an exponentially higher rate of suicide risk than females. But some information I'd also like to point out. Females are more likely to engage in several attempts um, because of the means that is popular for females to use, which can sometimes be poison, and they can sometimes be saved, and there may be repeated attempts. Males tend to use um, more deadly means, and that may be why the rates are higher. For instance, firearms. So um, some information that this slide doesn't show that is of importance. And risk is not the same for everyone. Although, is it 22% of high school students seriously considered suicide? Which is a huge number, and we don't even know how many of those cases go unreported. There are groups of teenagers, of adolescents, that are at risk, at, more at risk than others, such as our LGBTQ community, our Afri uh, African American community, and our females. Risk factors. There's individual factors, such as previous attempts, 
social isolation, an increase in substance use, self-injury, um, and relationship factors such as age. The more adverse childhood experiences someone has, the greater at risk they are for suicide. Bullying, family history of suicide, or a lot of peer conflict. And finally, community factors such as barriers to health care, stigma in some way. Um, unsafe media portrayals of suicide. Um, I've read that there is sometimes an uptick in suicides when we see a celebrity commit suicide. So that's important to be aware of. Um, and there's no one factor that contributes to a suicide. It's when there's multiple risk factors that our, our risk really increases. Protective factors, access to mental health care, being proactive. When we see these changes in ourselves and others, we break the stigma of going out and um, reaching out for help. Coping skills, um, limited access to lethal means, and of course cultural and religious beliefs um, are also protective factors. Having a relationship with one trusted adult is so beneficial to an adolescent and it greatly reduces their risk of suicide behaviors. Contact with a caring adult is the most significant protective factor. And that doesn't mean it's a parent per se. It just means that if there is one a caring adult in a child's life, their risk of suicide exponentially decreases. Building coping skills. Very personalized, of course. Some of you may like to run. Some of you may like to listen to music. But be aware of them. Help develop them in your child, if you can. Introduce them to a lot of different activities. Have them partake in them, whether they're feeling wonderful or whether they're feeling down. And the same goes for adults. Write down what you're grateful for. Talk to friends or family. Whatever gets you feeling better, even if you don't want to do it at that time, those are all coping skills that could help improve our mental health. This is Gizmo. Gizmo is a therapy dog um, who was found in a wonderful book that <coughs> NJ4S uses in our grammar schools. And what Gizmo strives to do is help children understand that your emotional health, your mental health, should be treated just as your physical health. If you're not feeling well or you cut your arm, you're most likely going to seek medical care. We're really trying to destigmatize at the elementary level, um, asking for help when you're just not feeling like you. And no matter what you do, after we help them develop their coping skills and their trusted adults, no matter what they do, they just can't seem to get away from that sadness. Because sadness is normal. But when we can't get it to go away, that's when we need to ask for help. Um, so Gizmo helps us do that with our students. And we hope that they are some of the warriors to help break that stigma about reaching out for help when we need it. Typical behavior versus potential warning signs. This is about adolescent behavior. Um, it's sad for parents a lot of the times, but it is completely normal for your teens to not want to be around you as much as they used to. Um, they want to be around their friends more. It's something they all experience. Um, that's okay. That is normal. It's when we see them withdraw from everybody or most things that they enjoy, their family, their friends especially, those sports that they used to love to play, they don't want to play it anymore. Now we know that that happens a lot with kids. One year they want to play soccer, the next year they're in piano. Also normal, but when they stop replacing those habits with new ones and they just seem to lose an interest in enjoying something in general, that's a, a sure shot sign that there may be an issue on the rise. Um, and we know teenagers lose their tempers. That's also normal, although, you know, of course it could be annoying at times. Normal. Um, but when there's aggressive behavior, purposefully breaking rules all the time, these are warning signs. Oh, and of course, how many times have we asked a teen to clean their room and it just doesn't get done? Is that a warning sign? Maybe not, but if they absolutely cannot focus on a task or a variety of tasks, again, warning sign, something may be going on. That's greater than just teen angst. And if somebody is having suicidal thoughts, 
there may be subtle warning signs. It's very important to know. Somebody may not just say, I'm thinking of completing suicide, or I, I'm having suicidal thoughts, I want to die. They could be very subtle. If you're seeing personality chain, uh, changes that just don't make sense, an increase in substance use, giving away possessions, that's a big one. Um, just feeling trapped, hygiene may change. These may be signs that somebody is experiencing suicidal thoughts. Does it mean that they definitely are? No, but perhaps it could be a sign um, that you should ask a question and start getting to the bottom of what is going on. Our teachers know our students. We know when certain students come in what to expect most times. So teachers are very valuable instruments in um, being eyes when our students are not in the home. Our teachers spend so much time with our children. So not being afraid to approach a child and say, hey, are you okay? Or contacting a school counselor, a school psychologist. If something doesn't seem right, what harm would it cause to say, I don't know if something's going on, but maybe we should look into this. Much more harm could be done if we don't say anything at all. Um, for instance, if you're seeing a decline in grades, if the interactions are changing or the student is very frustrated and this just doesn't seem right for that child, please ask. If you're not comfortable approaching the child, go to your guidance counselor in school. They'll have wonderful tips. And again, a normal adolescent behavior. Adolescent mood swings are normal. Sometimes they're a little lazy and may have a poor attitude or be immature. Does that mean that they're suffering from depression, anxiety, or thoughts of suicide? Absolutely not. Um, so it's, it's very difficult sometimes to distinguish who's having an issue, who is not. But if something just doesn't seem right to you, again, there's greater harm in not looking into it at all than asking some questions. If somebody is vocal about um, the thoughts of suicide that they may be having, it may not sound like I'm planning to commit suicide. You may hear things such as, I want to go to sleep and never wake up. What's the point of being here? I don't want to be in this pain anymore. I wish I had never been born. Comments like that warrant some questions and some further investigation. They can be side, um, signs of suicide ideation. Take them seriously. If anyone approaches you and feels safe enough around you to share these thoughts they are having, please take them seriously. Please do not say, oh, you'll get over it in a week. And that's part of the stigma, again. It's okay to reach out for help. Acknowledge, ask open-ended questions such as, well, how have you been feeling lately? What's changed? Give them the floor to truly tell you what they're feeling. And again, listen and be available. And the last question is very important, well, the last point, I should say, is very important. Don't be afraid to ask the question. There's a myth around the idea that if you ask someone if they're suicidal and they are not, you will cause them to be suicidal or you'll give them the idea. No. It is in best practice to ask directly, are you considering suicide? Do you have a plan to commit suicide? You're not going to give them the idea and you're not going to make them want to do it if they don't. And so don't minimize the situation. Like I said, if someone's saying, I'm really feeling down, I just can't get on top of it, don't say, well, come on, we all feel down sometimes. I felt down and I got over it. That's not helpful. Um, and it could be harmful. And again, don't be afraid to ask or, or ignore your limitations. As we said, you don't have to have the, all the answers. Um, no one is expected to fix or cure someone um, if, you, if you're not professionally trained. But when you show someone that you're there to listen to them, that is such a great tool. Again, it's not helpful. I mean, have you ever just been in a bad mood and wanted support even if it's not depression or suicide ideation and you say, oh, I had a horrible day and someone says, yeah, well, I had a horrible day too. What do you, what do you want? It's not helpful. It's not helpful. Um, so don't say things like, well, you have so much to be thankful for 
Or think about how your family would feel if you killed yourself. That person is in such a desperate place at that point. Comments like that, they're just not going to help. But it's the support, it's the willing to help them get that support that could truly save a life. Acknowledge. Again, listen to them. Take it seriously. Show them you care and tell a trusted adult that you are worried about your friend. Um, in a future slide, we'll see a program called um, Signs of Suicide that encourages students to take these steps if they see suicide ideation or behaviors in their friend and who is a trusted adult. Um, and we'll talk about that further. But parents, if it's not you, please don't be insulted. I know it's hard. But as long as your child or someone you care about has someone they feel safe sharing with, that's what is truly most important. And that trusted adult may change over time. Becoming a good friend means not keeping a secret. This is tough. I mean, this is tough for adults, so of course this is tough for adolescents. If an adolescent's friend shares with them, yeah, I am considering suicide, they may say, well, if I tell someone, my friend's never going to talk to me again. I can't possibly tell the school nurse or tell their parents. They won't want to be friends with me anymore. And through the Signs of Suicide program, we tell them, and yeah, they may be mad at you for a while. But they will also know that you are there to support them. And you may help save their life. So trusted adults. We tell kids, how do you know who a trusted adult is? Um, and they may have different trusted adults. And we go over this even in the Gizmo program with grammar school age children. Um, it's someone who you know well, who knows who you know if you share your feelings with them they will listen to you they will take you seriously and they will make you feel safe it may be a parent but again it doesn't have to be it could be a family member it could be a teacher a coach a religious leader a neighbor anyone who you feel safe with sharing is who we encourage children's and adult children and adolescents to reach out to because when we listen, we hear someone into existence. You may be the only one to ask the question, are you OK? Do you need some help? You may be the only one. And again, it can truly save a life. Some resources. The Not OK app. What if there's a button you could press and someone would immediately know you're not OK? So if Please feel free to take pictures if you want these for later reference. I know it's very hard to remember, but there's some great ones. Um, and here, oh, should I go back to that one? Sorry about that. A little bit more information about the Signs of Suicide program that NJ4S offers. Um, we teach the signs and symptoms that we may experience or that adolescents may experience if they are thinking about suicide. And we teach them how to recognize those signs in their friends and then what to do if they experience a friend who is having these feelings. And it is emphasized, we are not asking you to save your friend. We couldn't possibly do that. But we are asking you, if you see something, ask and encourage help and don't keep that secret. And we do that through um, clips and questions. On the right, there's a depression inventory. If any of the students want to take with them, um, they can gauge how they're feeling. This is a wonderful website um, that MHA offers. It's stopteensuicide.com dot mha inspire dot org it beautifully outlines all of the information that we touched on in this presentation as long as um, as well as lists wonderful references I mean excuse me wonderful resources again that's stop teen suicide dot mha inspire dot org anything about signs symptoms what to do who to go to it will all be on there for you so I see some people taking a picture I'll give it a minute Some more resources. And this is not only for children, I believe. 988 is for all children, adults. If anybody needs it, 988 offers help all the time. Second floor is for New Jersey residents. 
Trevor Lifeline focuses their care on the LGBTQ community. And a cri another crisis text line, um, please text TALK or text 741-741. Fortunately, it's becoming easier and easier to get help if we just make the decision to do so. Oops, sorry about that, I'll go back. <laughs> There is an exhaustive list of support services if you're interested in having this QR code. It's very comprehensive. Again, help is out there. There's many types of help out there. There's um, organizations that tailor to specific populations. There is help out there if we reach out to get it. Crisis resources. Again, an exhaustive list. There is help out there to fill virtually any mental health need out there today. And Team Con Connect Line. Um, Tracy has been instrumental in implementing this program. This is not a crisis line, but it's for youth aged 13 to 24. Um, who maybe just need somebody to talk to. They don't want to go to a friend or to mom and dad, and maybe they're, they just want to have somebody who says, hey, you know, what's going on? Let's chat. There's a service for that, and it's run by young people, so it's not going to be Mrs. Windsor, the teacher, who's going to answer the phone. It's going to be someone who they may feel they can better connect with. And finally, our director, Tracy Capicelli, who is here, is an absolute wonderful resource for mental health, um, suicide uh, prevention, depression, and she is here if you have any questions. So thank you so much for your time. I just want to also say that the presentation you just saw, we're going to make available on all our municipal websites. And uh, we're going to make all of that information available through social media in every way that we currently share information with one another. Uh, before we move on, I think this is a great opportunity for you guys to meet three of our superintendents. Because it was even seven or eight months ago, we all got together and we were talking about a couple different initiatives. and. Um, we were taken back on the incredible um, pieces they have in place to deal with our children that are struggling. So our dear friends, and uh, Mr. Wasco, right behind you is the retired chief of Bayonne PD and a retired, um, I believe, detective and councilman, Booker. And Mike Wasco is also from Bayonne, guys. But I'd like to introduce Maria Carroll, Hanover Township Superintendent, uh, Hanover Park Regional Superintendent, Mike Wasco, Hanover Township, and Dr. Steve Caponegro. If you guys would like to take the floor and make a few comments regarding anything you heard or anything you'd like to share with us that you currently have in place that might make people happy or more comfortable, we'd appreciate it. If you go to the mic, that'd be great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. As Mayor Gallagher said, my name is Maria Carroll. I'm superintendent of schools at the Hanover Park Regional High School District. Um, we have worked very closely with Tracy over the past few years. And one thing that we have done is uh, we have approached mental health and uh, knowing in dealing with our adolescents, it is not a one-size-fits-all type of mentality. Every child is different. Every child has different needs. And we're there to address those different needs with different layers of support that we have within our district. Um, specifically to the Hanover Park Regional High School District, not only do we have outside services such as the Mental Health Association, such as our partners with St. Clair's. Um, we have counselors on staff, we have um, school social workers on staff, we have school psychologists on staff, and we also, uh, this is our third year, is that we put in a wellness program. And we have a wellness coordinator for our students at both Hanover Park High School and Whippany Park High School, which is a unique feature that we put in because we wanted to not stigmatize the mental health aspect of dealing with youth, but we wanted to talk about the wellness and what we need to do to keep ourselves healthy in order for our students to develop in a very positive manner. Um, so that wellness coordinator does work between our 
two districts, or two high schools, excuse me. She works with our students on an individual basis. She works in small groups. She also works with large groups. She has parent presentations, and she also works with our faculty as well. Um, so she is a added resource that we feel is a great benefit to our district, um, and just adds another layer of support that we currently have in place in dealing with our youth, both at Hanover Park High School and Whippany Park High School. So thank you, everyone. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Mike Wasco, Superintendent of Schools in Hanover Township. I'm very blessed and proud of the fact that I've been associated with this community for 26 years as an educator, uh, going back to the spring of 1998. And uh, similar to Maria, and similar to what some of the folks on the DS have said tonight, um, there are no boundaries amongst the regional superintendents, especially the last several years with the networking that we have done, pooling our resources and realizing that it truly takes a village in terms of what we do with our students. And we valued in Hanover Township uh, several years ago the importance of that SEL, the social and emotional wellness and health component. Without that in place and kids feeling safe coming to school, makes learning that much more difficult. Aside from the challenges that we face the last several years with regards to COVID-19, and I've been very blessed to have a supportive community and a supportive Board of Education that a number of years ago allowed us to take some proactive steps for a small K-8 district of 1,200 um, 1200 to 1,400 students with four schools where we started out with two full-time guidance counselors in the middle school. And then we had one elementary school counselor split amongst three schools and our Board of Education supported expanding that to putting a full-time elementary counselor in each of our elementary schools. Again, valuing things uh, with regards to that social and emotional wellness component with our students feeling good about coming to school. And then we began to implement the programs with our character education programs based on our six pillars of character and also making connections with the community. I think uh, some of you have mentioned that tonight and I believe it's later on in the agenda, the importance of making connections. And when we return, and, and I think it it really, we're very proud of the fact that as a community in Hanover Township, valuing that social and emotional component part and connections, we were able to open our doors for in-person instruction in the K-8 districts in Hanover every day for in-person learning because it was that important for us to get kids in the school buildings where they belong during that very trying times in September of 2020. And a credit to our Board of Education, to all our staff members, and to all our families who worked with us to put us in a position to be able to do that. And I think that was a great, great accomplishment for our community to be in that position. And as things evolved and as things change, and understanding the value of those connections and the importance of kids feeling good about coming to school, we've expanded some of our resources, particularly in the community connections component, making connections with some of the corporations in our community, bringing programs into our schools, bringing guest speakers, and for many years, um, and and you know this, we go back a number of years, a long time, with the Substance Awareness Council and Committee that was in town, bringing in heavy hitter speakers for our kids that we would have never been able to provide for that experience for our students and staff with the school budget that we have. And those outside organizations allowed us to do that, making connections with Hanover Rotary, understanding the value of community service, et cetera. And we've also partnered with a group called Care Plus, that allows us to bring in experts that are um, uh, providing our students with services on the spot to do assessments if someone is um, experiencing some difficult times, make some concerning statements, what have you, whether it be threats regarding the school themselves or others. We have now brought in a service, Care Plus, that provides instant, um, uh, if you want to say, um, assessments that makes a decision as to whether or not what is our next course of action going to be. That's above and beyond what we do as a school community with our uh, crisis intervention teams, which are now the BTAM, or the Behavioral Threat Assessments, which many of you may have heard about uh, in the last year, in particular due to some of the, the new laws that are coming down uh, from the state with regards to those programs. But the great thing about a person like Care Plus 
there's a disconnection in a sense, and I know it's counterintuitive thinking with the school district in terms of things because we've learned over the years some folks have a hard time uh, being open and honest about mental health and mental wellness and struggles. So the great thing is when you have an outside person that is connected to the schools, it not only provides the students with that opportunity to share things, but it also provides supports to the family that go beyond the normal school hours, which as we, we know, a lot of things may happen and occur with our students is outside of the school day, outside of school hours at one o'clock in the morning on a Saturday. So we are constantly evolving and adapting our programs to meet what we feel are the needs of the students and the families in the communities. And a lot of it has to do with working and being part of a great community that is supportive of what we do here in the schools. And we look forward to cooperatively working with the township and all of our partners in Hanover Township as we move forward in this endeavor. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Dr. Steve Capanagro. Mayor Pinulo, I'm going to uh, side with you and lower the microphone so everyone can hear me and see me. Uh, I'm Steve Capanagro from Florham Park Schools. It is my uh, 22nd year working in the Florham Park Schools. I often call it my home away from home. I've known Ace, Mayor Taylor, Mayor Pinulo for many, many years. Ace, I remember about 10 or 12 years ago when we were just talking about items. If you remember that back in the day with Dr. Anziti, so on and so forth, and look where this committee has come. I said that Mr. Uh, Mrs. Carroll stole a lot of my talking points, but then Mr. Um, Wasco stole the other half of my talking points, <laughs> so it's always great to go last. Um, we do have many of the services provided that were outlined in Hanover Park, as well as Hanover Township, um, Care Plus, as well as um, each school having a, a counselor now and a school psychologist, not just for students, but also for the teachers, so the teachers understand what they could do to help. We have weekly meetings, um, crisis teams. We also uh, teamed up with Project Pride, uh, Project Community Pride for the last 22 years. I, I used to be the head of special services in the Florida Park Schools and I was lucky to be the liaison for Project Pride where mental health and crisis intervention was really seen as an, as an issue when a lot of times in the society it was not. I'm not saying I'm glad it is seen as an issue, but it is an issue and I'm glad that we partnered with Mayor Taylor, the borough, and the uh, police department to be part of that 20, 22 years ago and then extend it to what we now have now. Um, uh, I'm blessed to be here with uh, this group here. I know um, Ms. Carroll, Mr. Wasco, the mayors, we work very closely together and that just came to fruition during COVID where we saw the benefit of smaller towns working together for a greater good. So I don't have more information to provide. I know they stole everything I was going to say, uh, but that just shows how close we are working together. But I appreciate the invite and being part of this conversation. So thank you. Thank you. I'd like to say, uh, if you would please take the floor for a few minutes, we'd greatly appreciate it. Ladies and gentlemen, Lucy Bill. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ace. So we're changing gears here a little bit and jumping a couple of generations. Um, I can tell you that over the course of many years, I worked with hundreds and hundreds of individuals and families who were caring for aging parents, relatives, sometimes even close friends, either because there was no family, which very often happens, or the family members were estranged, or simply because the family members were not interested in being involved. You'd be amazed how often that helps. But I was able to see firsthand the physical the emotional and the mental health challenges that we face as we age. And I and my family are all going through that ourselves at this point. Even among seniors with large, well-intentioned families, one of the saddest, most universal issues in aging is social isolation and loneliness. I had a client years ago who, who was a perfect caregiver, a loving daughter. She had a family, a husband, two teenagers, she worked full time, but her mother lived around the corner and she stopped after work every afternoon to visit her mom just to make sure everything was okay. And one afternoon she got there, her mother greeted her and 
she knew something wasn't quite right, and she said, Mom, your, your voice is so raspy. Are you okay? Are you coming down with a cold? And her mom said, oh, very matter-of-factly, no, 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 this, this is just the first time I've spoken today. That's not good. That's not good for mental health or physical health. In order to be happy, we all need three things. We need someone to love, something to do, and something to look forward to. As we age, we start to lose all these things. The people we've spent our lives loving are dying or becoming debilitated or moving away. The something to do. Most of us, especially men, define themselves by their professions. Well, what do you do? Well, I'm an engineer, I'm an electrician, I'm an attorney, I'm a plumber. Women, in addition to their careers, very often identify themselves as wives and mothers. Well, when you retire, you no longer have your professional identity, and people lose their spouses, their children move away. And when it comes to something to look forward to, we all know as we age, we have more miles behind us than we do ahead of us. There's not as much to look forward to. We start to lose all three of these things. And very often our seniors in our communities become invisible. They're not working, not going to school, maybe not as socially active as they were when they were younger, so no one even misses them if they're not showing up for work or school or to some organization. No one even knows that they're home alone and sad. There are no red flags of concern that go up. And as a result, the mental health challenges go unnoticed. And unaddressed. So people who are socially isolated have chronic illness, have chronic pain, are at high risk of depression and anxiety. They're at high risk for substance use disorder, especially alcohol among seniors. And they're at high risk for suicide. Several years ago, right here in Hanover Township, we had a suicide in one of our long-term care facilities. Some of you may be aware of that. I'll bet most of you aren't. It wasn't newsworthy. When a child dies, when a teenager dies, the community comes out in support of the families. Not so much when someone older is lost. Now I know Jolene talked about this a little earlier, about teenagers and young adults and, and the incidence of suicide. And when I ask this question of most people and I say, well, what demographic do you think has the highest rate of suicide in the country? Most people say teenagers and young adults. Well, I'm not very big on statistics. But according to the National Council of Behavioral Health and the Centers for Disease Control, this statistic may surprise you. In the case of 100 teenagers who may attempt suicide, <clears throat> one will succeed. Thank God the number is so low. In the case of men, over his 75 years of age, one in four who attempt suicide will succeed. The highest rate of suicide in this country is men over 75 years of age. The most common means of suicide is firearms, 51% of suicide 
is at the hands of firearms. And why are many older men more successful at, at this endeavor? Well, they usually have easier access to means. They have higher capability. They're more determined. And again, because of social isolation, they're less likely to have a support system or somebody who might recognize that depression and say, hey, what's going on? Can I help? Just like Jolene said earlier, ask the question. But there's nobody to ask the question. This is an entirely different population and one of the most vulnerable in our communities. Mental health crisis in the senior population in this country is at an all-time high. The message I want to share tonight is don't wait for a crisis to get educated about resources, not just in relation to seniors, but to everyone across the lifespan, if you wait for a crisis, you will have far fewer resources. You need to learn about the elder care and mental health resources in our community. Now, there's a handout up here on the table, four pages of elder care resources. I'm not going to bore you by going through all of this, but it's here for you to take. And I will be sharing this with Mayor Gallagher, and he'll be posting it on the Hanover Township website. But if there are two resources I can share with you as a first line of touchstones, I know they're up there on the screen. The type is very small, but they are included in this list. The first line, the, absolutely your first resource, especially here in Morris County, is the New Jersey ADRC. That's the Aging and Disability Resource Connection. Every county in the state of New Jersey, all 21 counties, have an office on aging. And when you reach out to that website or call that number, you will be connected to the one in your county. One of Morris County's best kept secrets is our office on aging. They are absolutely stellar. They have resources about adult day centers, which, by the way, was the solution for this daughter's mother who hadn't been talking all day. Once we sat down and talked about it, and I suggested an adult day center, and her mom, after quite a bit of cajoling, <laughs> agreed to participate. She started two days a week, then three, then wound up going five. And she had stories to tell her daughter every night when she came by to visit. You can get information about adult day centers, geriatricians, home care agencies, long-term care facilities, transportation services, Meals on Wheels, everything there is to know about elder care resources in each county can be found through the ADRC. <clears throat> Excuse me. My next recommendation is to reach out to the Aging Life Care Association. That is a national network of credentialed and vetted geriatric care managers. A care manager is, is like a general contractor or a football quarterback. They manage all the other resources that need to be brought into play to take care of the person at risk. They do an assessment. They come up with a care plan. They do the monitoring. You can get resources from the ADRC, but the geriatric care manager is the one who's going to tell you, well, these are the good ones. These are the not so good ones. There are good home care agencies and not so good ones. There are good long-term care facilities and not so good ones. You're not going to get that from a list on the internet. You need someone who knows your family and can come in and do a personal assessment. So what I've done really in this short time is give you a thumbnail sketch of the situation and what some of the resources are. There is help out there, but you need to be proactive and reach out for it. 
whether it's a senior, a teenager, a mom, a dad, or anyone in between. So my, my best advice is to be proactive, reach out to the resources that have been shared tonight, and you can make a difference. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, we have Kathy Whitehead, our public health nurse supervisor in Hanover Township. So we'd like to take the floor for a minute about the value of getting help. So, wow, following Lucille. Lucille and I have worked together for a really, really long time. For probably what, at least 10, 15 years. Maybe 20 years, like when, back when I was a visiting nurse. And, uh, uh, I, I wish we had time to, to talk about, um, afterwards I'll tell you about a program that we're going to be doing here in Hanover Township to um, connect, to uh, uh, help seniors connect, Wonderful. help them evaluate their mental health and uh, we applied for a big grant and we didn't get it but we're still going to do the program and which is really exciting. Glad to hear it. So I'm going to, right now honestly I feel like I'm preaching to the choir here. Um, about uh, the value of um, therapy, but I'm, I'm going to tell you about it anyway. Okay, so um, a huge benefit to talk therapy is that its effects are long lasting. And this is because you're not only working through stuff, but you're developing the tools to help you deal with future stuff. Psychodynamic treatment is durable over the years. An awesome benefit to therapy is that not only helps you understand yourself better, but it helps you understand other people. <coughs> when, we hold on to, when we hold negative thoughts in without processing them, they become ingrained so we see the world through that lens. And we make lots of assumptions, <coughs> some that may or may not be true. Since big and small problems are going to come up from time to time, knowing how to deal with them in a healthy way is an essential skill. Conflict is a part of every day. One of the coolest things about therapy is that it can bring change at the level of the brain. We think of medication as changing the depressed brain, but there's very compelling evidence that talk therapy does the same. The best thing about dealing with your own stuff is that if you have kids, it helps teach them a better way. For those of us who grew up in households where stuff just wasn't talked about, and look how many de decades later we're still dealing with the fallout of that, parents can help teach their children vocabulary about feelings early on by modeling it themselves. So. I'm going to give you two examples of my own personal life about making a call to a therapist and the changes that I think it brought into my family. The first one is really simple. My son was a good student and we were in a really small school district. But his dad and I always felt like he had ADD, but the school district didn't agree. He had great grades. He was a good kid, but he was very disorganized. We even had him privately tested, but because they required input from the school, it never went anywhere. But when he went to high school, it was a huge high school. And by his sophomore year, his grades looked like he never even went to class. And we talked and we talked, and uh, one day I just said, Alex, it looks like you're not even going to class. Your grades are so terrible. And I was just <laughs> so out of my league. And finally he agreed to go to therapy. And so I called his guidance counselor and I got a really good, I got a couple of uh, uh, referrals and, and he went. And after a couple of sessions, the, doc, the therapist said, you know, I think it would be a good, a good idea to have him evaluated by a medical doctor. <coughs> so we had him uh, evaluated and after three sessions, uh, they uh, diagnosed him with ADD. And it's pretty late in the game to have a kid diagnosed with ADD by sophomore year, but, but uh, he, he accepted that and um, took the medication, but he continued with the therapy to learn how to be a, a better student. And we went to therapy to learn how to be a better parent 
for him and to help him. <coughs> and the short of it is, or the long of it is, is that he went to college and he's a software engineer now. And um, I really think it's because, you know, we positively talked about therapy and we positively encouraged him and we had a good guidance counselor and, and you know, uh, some, pe some people say, well, how did you make that all happen? And, you know, sometimes I use that corny statement, well, all, all the moons aligned. Um, but I, I don't want to make it sound all flowery like finding a, a, a therapist is easy because I know, especially in this day and age, I hear the stories from my friends. But it, it's, uh, my, my purpose of my story is to say that it's really worth it and to stay involved when your child is in therapy. But I have a really more important story to tell you about a family whose whole family was in crisis with a three-year-old little girl who had such anxiety I can't even begin to describe it to you. And so it's my sister-in-law and my brother. And so my sister-in-law uh, got a, a, a friend who gave her a, a, a therapy. Um, they made a therapy appointment for my niece. And after three evaluations with the niece and, and, and the family, uh, my brother and sister-in-law went in to meet with the therapist. And the therapist took one look at my brother and said, well, until you get your drinking under control, your family is con con considered to be, continue to be in chaos. And even though my brother was under the care of another person, and I really, to this day, will never know what it is exactly that the therapist said to my brother, whether it was that no one ever coordinated it with that your drinking is directly affecting your children but whatever she said, it hit a chord with him, and he has been sober for 14 years. All because that little girl had such anxiety, and my sister-in-law made that phone call. So if you have to use my story for one of your friends, any story, do so. But always remember, most of your workplaces have EAP, People here in Hanover Township are sick of me telling people to go to EAP. <laughs> but it, talk therapy is, is, is priceless. I, I can't begin to tell you how important it is. So, thank you. Mayor Pruno, please take the floor. I, I sure will. I've been waiting. <laughs> Look, I'm looking at everyone out over the audience. Everyone has been so patient and so attentive of the message that's been given tonight. It's a tribute to each and every one of you that have stayed to listen. So I know this is something very dearly to everybody's heart, but there's something that's very dear to my heart, too. I have two of what I call the backbone of our council here that are representing East Hanover. I want to introduce Councilman Brian Brokaw, who sat here all night. And Councilman Michael Mortarelli. Very quickly, all too often, the mayors get a lot of the credit, and our council, which I consider the backbone of all of us mayors, they don't get enough credit. They work very hard at it. You also don't get enough criticism like we do, but that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. So without any further ado, those uh, delicious pastries, if anybody doesn't know, Sorrentos is guess where? East Hanover. <laughs> so it gives me great joy and great pleasure to introduce to you tonight someone that I've known for over 30 years who has worked for me. I've watched him come up as an officer a sergeant, a lieutenant, and then a captain. And uh, I feel like he's an adopted son. He's watched over me as I was an adopted father. He's given me great advice over the years, and I know tonight he'll add great intelligence to what we all feel very deeply about here. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce Chief Jack Ambrose. Thanks, Mayor. Ladies and gentlemen, America's mayor. <laughs> hey, on behalf of the sheriff, one of the most important things he developed when he was walking door to door throughout the county 
when he decided to run for, for sheriff was addiction. Number one concern in people's families was addiction. And he developed uh, Hope One. And the mother of Hope One is Erica Valvano, who's going to make our presentation. Good evening, everyone. I'm Corporal Erica Valvano with the Morris County Sheriff's Office. There is our sheriff right here in Morris County. And in 2017, we started a program. Uh, we really just hit the ground running. We had no idea what to expect when we went out into the community. And from there, we've made over 42,000 contacts. So it's really amazing to see um, how bringing services into the community to the at-risk population, um, whether it is people without support or whether it is family members and friends who just don't know where to turn, right? Their loved one is struggling with substance use or mental health. Where do I turn? What do I do? Um, so that's what we do. We bring addiction and mental health services into the community. Our vehicle has our stigma-free logo because our team is stigma-free, judgment-free. We meet people where they're at, literally, geographically, um, clinically. We are there in the community meeting people um, and letting them know, like a lot of people have said today, uh, that someone cares, right? That we're there, we care, whether they're an active substance user, whether they're you know, struggling with their mental health, we're there, we're able to provide them with support, whether it is just a cup of coffee, or whether it is actually you know, Al and Pito from our team are here tonight, sitting with them and getting them connected to services right on the spot. So we set up throughout Morris County every day. Uh, this week we'll be in Florham Park at Crescent Plaza. Uh, we're at Morristown Green. We're at the Morris Plains train station. So we are very involved with everyone here tonight. Homeless outreach is something that we are really passionate about, about as a team because we do, believe it or not, uh, the commissioner said, we are one of the wealthiest counties, but our homeless population is over 400 with the point in time check. And I was at a meeting the other day, we have 1,200 people, unduplicated people, on a wait list for housing. So it's very real. We are um, you know, in the middle of a crisis, you know, whether it is because evictions ha are now active, right? We had the furlough for ev evictions, and now they're people are being evicted. So whether they are a member of the elderly population being evicted, you know, can we put them in a shelter? You know, these are all things that we're encountering and how using our resources and our connections and our relationships is really uh, benefiting and really just making the programs even more successful. Like I said, we are partnered with the Mental Health Association. We work very closely with them. They do staff our vehicles so that in real time, if somebody does visit our location, uh, which you can find online, they can meet with that mental health professional at the truck. Same thing with our peer recovery specialist from CARES. If someone's struggling with substance use or has a family member or friend struggling, they can meet right with that peer recovery specialist at the truck. So not only did Sheriff Gannon launch Hope One here in Morris County, but our team was able to go and spread Hope One across the state. We are in eight other counties. So everywhere from Atlantic to Warren County has a Hope One program that is tailored to their community's need, right? Because Hope One Atlantic City feeds the people in the street. And Hope One Warren County has such a big area to cover that they're trying to reach the rural area, right? So each Hope One looks different, but we're able to use that same concept to tailor it to the community that we're serving. Life-saving Narcan kits are one of the things that we do do from the truck and we do give away. And I just wanted to share tonight, we are at 7,999 kits given out. 
So if you'd like to make some Hope One history, uh, <laughs> Hope One Narcan kit number 8,000 can be given out tonight as we're all here talking about how we can help people struggling with substance use and mental health. We all launched another program because if you know Sheriff Gannon, he's going to help people no matter how he can. So we launched another program from Hope One to help people at an acutely elevated risk. So what that is, is it brings 60 service providers together because if we're not working together, we can't be successful, right? So it brings those 60 service providers together every week to address these individuals that are referred to our program. So whether we're working with Navigating Hope, who's here tonight, uh, connecting people to benefits because Morris County is on the forefront of bringing services to the client. So Navigating Hope brings social services in the community. So we're bringing mental health and substance use. Navigating Hope's bringing social services, benefits, food stamps, cash assistance, all the things that we need to wrap people struggling with, right? We need to wrap them with this warm blanket of services so that we can successfully get them back on their feet. So our referral is really easy. We have um, all of our police departments know about our program as well. So they can, as they are on, again, boots on the ground with somebody struggling, they can scan the QR code and fill out the referral. And that goes right to our team. I'll go back. We will share all these resources as well. If you check out the Sheriff's Office website as well, you will see um, each of these referral forms as well as our Hope One calendar. So you can check the calendar, see when we're going to be in your area. If you have a family member or friend struggling, they can check the calendar. Come visit the team. Uh, we welcome everybody with open arms. Um, I think that's why we've been successful, and I think that's why we'll continue to be able to wrap people in those services that they need. So this is just our contact info. Again, you will have that. And then I just want to share really quick. We have been um, giving away Narcan. We think everybody should carry Narcan because you never know whether it is in a parking lot or a public restroom, you could witness someone overdose, right? Um, now, on top of people overdosing um, from opioids, whether it's heroin, fentanyl, um, xylazine was added to the mix. So now xylazine is out there. Um, so if you have heard about it, um, it is true. It has spiked in our area. Um, this is data from the state police uh, that takes it from the whole state, right? So we are seeing a rise in that as well. I just like to hit on that uh, when we're talking about the opiate epidemic, when we're talking about people struggling with substance use and mental health. Um, what is an overdose? What does it look like? Things like that. How Narcan works, I'm going to really quick go through this because we're not doing a Narcan training right now. But life-saving Narcan is something that we do, uh, again, from Hope One. So if you encounter somebody that is overdosing, obviously always call 911. Um, administer your Narcan if you have it. If it is, a lot of different places now are putting Narcan with their AEDs. So you know, if somebody either has Narcan, you know, obviously administer it. If not, wait till 911 arrives. Let them know what you see, um, and so on. That's it. Thank you. Mayor, could I just just interject a, a couple of other things? Uh, great job. But something else uh, on the opioid. Uh, Epidemic. The county is going to see in 2024 funds from the opioid settlement, so um, that's going to be something we're going to be able to help you know, make these services more robust. Um, and I believe it's you folks that do IDs for folks that don't have them, and that's critical when you think about it. And you know, I've just heard the sheriff talk about it. If you don't have an ID, you basically don't have an existence yeah. or a life. I mean, you can't go anywhere. So that's something else that the uh, county is able to provide. Um, and then actually there's a hope wing in the jail as well, um, which is uh, very, very helpful. And something brand new is the uh, new uh, New Jersey reentry program that was just announced uh, a week ago um, to try to bring the recidivism rate down. 
Um, so there's a couple of other things. I uh, just wanted to toot your horn a little more um, that I wanted to highlight as well. Thank you, Commissioner. <coughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. And in addition to being the Superintendent of Recreation and Park Administration, I coordinate the Mayor's Wellness Campaign here in Hanover Township. And I just want to take a minute to thank uh, Mayor Gallagher for being such an active participant in our program. The mayor has worked out with the B Meadow Pool swim team. He's worked out with the Recreation Bobcats wrestlers, the Hanover Tiger cheering squad and football team. He's presented medals at the Healthy Kin running event. And he did the senior circuit with uh, our instructor, Ava Ventron. This summer, the mayor and the seniors had a brunch at the B Meadow Pool followed by swimming. And tonight's mental health symposium is an important part of the mayor's wellness campaign as uh, mental health is a key component to good overall health. So I want to thank you, uh, Mayor, for being such a great participant. Well, it's been wonderful. I got the biggest kick, of, a kick out of this when we first started and we were with the Bobcat wrestlers um, the mayor was going around and he was introducing himself to all the boys and saying you know I'm the mayor and if you have if you ever have a problem here this card give me a call and this one little boy was why did you want to be mayor he really wanted to know and the mayor said because I want to help and I thought this is such a great example of helping, and and uh, I I just thought it was so great. The kids got such a kick out of it, and I really I re it was a really great connection. And that's what I'm here to talk to you about. I'm here to talk to you about uh, making connections. Um, I often say I have the best job in town, and I do. And one of the reasons that that's true is that recreation touches every individual in the township, regardless of their age or their ability or their interests. So you could say that about DPW because you know they pick up everybody's garbage and they do the streets. Yeah. And you could say that about finance because you go to finance and you pay your taxes and that's what makes everything happen. But honestly, recreation is where the fun is and where people come to have a good time and where we want to get people together to do things that they like to do uh, in beautiful places. And so I think recreation is the best. So recreation is great because whether you enjoy passive recreation, like walking around a beautiful new path around the Bee Meadow Pool, or having a picnic at the park, or relaxing beside the fountain at, Mal at Malapartis Park, you can do that as a family, as an individual, with your friends. Or you might like something more active but unscheduled, like meeting your friends at Blackbrook Park to play pickleball or tennis, um, or like a certain recreation commissioner I know, you might want to play basketball with your friends on Saturday morning. So you can do make up your own kind of rec, but the facility is available. You might be a parent, like I was for many years, running around like crazy to all the organized sports activities in town. So you're busy bringing your children to organized sporting events like Little League or the Hanover Tiger football team and cheering squad or Hanover soccer, so you're at one of our many fields. Recreation connects you to your favorite activity. Um, you might know it, recreation from our classes, uh, classes available for all ages and all uh, abilities. And um, we have a, a lot of classes, several classes, because we have such a large senior population in town that are geared to the seniors. And we have our senior circuit. And that class targets uh, those over 60 who want to continue their wellness journey with exercise classes geared for them. Um, we have basketball, swim teams, all sorts of things. We give our, our, junior, uh, our junior school kids a chance to ski and to snowboard. We have adult sports like indoor men and ladies basketball and men and ladies softball. So we really cover the gamut. Recreation is a big part of uh, everyday life, and it, it doesn't matter your, your age or your, inter your interests. But our, rec our commitment, recreation's commitment to Hanover Township residents isn't limited just to sports and fitness. And indeed, our dial -a ride service provides uh, a very important uh, service of rides to medical appointments and food shopping for those individuals that can't do it or don't have family members who can do it and need that extra help getting there. And so we're looking forward to adding another vehicle by the end of this year so we can increase the number of clients that we service and expand the area that you go to and as a result connect even more seniors to the services they require. Because they've asked, can we go to Costco or can we go to CVS or can I get my hair done? And right now we don't have the we don't have the cars or the or the drivers to do it, but we're we're in the process of adding that. And I think one important thing that we did with Dial a Ride that came as a result of a request from one of the drivers was 
could we go to um, the Veterans Hospital? That we had some veterans who, who weren't able to be serviced, and so, um, and that was outside of our, our scope, but the Rec Commissioner said, of course, you know, set it up, and we did. And so we had um, a couple of veterans who hadn't been able to get hearing aids, and they got hearing aids as a result. And so it was really, it's really a wonderful program, and we're looking to expand that. So when the pandemic pretty much shut down the whole world, Hanover Township Recreation continued to be part of everyday life. And we worked with our partner Wegmans to develop um, the Hanover Hit the Trail program, and it uses a passport that has 10 different paths in town. And this program, which is still in existence today, enables individuals and couples and families to exercise outdoors, and you get prizes for doing it. So, I mean, what more could you ask for? Um, we learned a lot of powerful lessons during the pandemic, and one of the most important lessons is how crucial personal connections are to well-rounded lives. So I mentioned this in the beginning. I have five children, and they range in age from 30 to 40, and they live from London to Los Angeles. And during the pandemic, my husband set up a weekly Zoom call so we could all talk and check in on one another. So it's how are you doing financially, how are you doing uh, uh, mentally, how are you doing physically and emotionally. And so that weekly connection for me reduced a lot of anxiety. And that is what connections do. Uh, they lower stress and anxiety. Um, and, and people connect in different ways. So if you're in Hanover Township and you don't really like sports and you don't want to do that, but you really love nature, well, you can be part of the Stony Brook Community Farm and Garden. And you can get your hands dirty in a beautiful backdrop and connect with Mother Nature. Perhaps you don't like sports. You don't, but you love karate. We have a great karate program that helps kids out. We offer sewing classes. We said to the seniors, you want to play cards once a week with your friends? Come to the community center. That's what we're here for. We'll set it up for you. Come Friday afternoons, play bunko, play mahjong, play whatever you want, but come. Be together, have a good time. So now that we've returned to normalcy, we're, we're continuing to realize that the people-to-people -people connections are the most powerful. And according to the New Jersey Healthcare Quality Institute, and that's the organization that oversees the mayor's wellness campaign, health risks associated with social isolation and loneliness include premature death, increased risk of dementia, increased rates of depression and suicide. And prior to the pandemic, 43% of adults age 60 or older reported feeling lonely. That is a huge number, and that number only grew because of the self-imposed isolation of COVID. And so recreation's goal is to get people out or in, in the community center or out into the community and connect with one another. Individuals who have strong social connections are happier, they have fewer mental health concerns and better overall health um, outcomes. So last week, the mayor's uh, wellness campaign held a balance clinic for seniors with our partner Sports Care. And so we had more than 40 seniors come and Sports Care uh, did some testing with them to gauge their balance. But the, the big thing was everybody sitting around while they're waiting for their, their evaluation and talking about, does this happen to you? What happens when, this, you know, when you fall over, what do you do, you know, who do you call? And it was great because it really gave everybody a chance to see everybody is suffering with this you know everybody we all have the same problems but what do you do and what do you do and that kind of connection is what is so important and so at the end of the 90 minutes they made connections with one another and they had received critical advice on how to improve their balance our connections aren't limited to seniors Hanover Township Recreation Summer Plus Camp connects high school students who are camp counselors with the elementary school students who are campers and that connection is so strong so strong that our current camp director <coughs> started at Summer Plus as a camper. And the thing I love about when we interview the, the camp counselors is I say, you know, you are so important as your first job, but you are gonna have a long lasting impact on your campers. And when they see you at Quick Check, they're gonna say to their mother, that's my counselor. And you are gonna feel so proud that you had a positive impact on that kid's life. And so that, that is what I love about REC. And, and it's just the best feeling. 
Well, anyway, Hanover Township Recreation's connections to its residents extends to local businesses and organizations. So we, we not, not only bring our residents together, but we bring our residents together with other businesses and organizations. And as uh, Mayor said, on January 5th, 2024, Friday night nights at Men and Begin Again, the skating nights, so our, our youngsters can find a fun and safe place to connect with their current friends and make new friends. Keeping tweens and teens busy and connected and out of trouble extends beyond sports. It also includes dance and karate, music and art. So if recreation doesn't offer the program, there's a connection to someone in town who does and we will get you fixed up if we can. So Hanover Township Recreation wants you and your family and friends to be socially connected and integrated into your community. The benefits of this connection will make you happier and healthier. If you have a program idea or something you'd like to try, please contact Recreation. We are always open to doing new things, and uh, I, we would love to hear from you. Uh, I want to be—I want to tell you how um, very—I um, don't want to use the word intimidated, but honored I felt to be up on the dais tonight at this platform with all of these, these wonderful people uh, with uh, such great information. And um, thank you very much for including me. And please, if Come to the community center, come see us, and uh, be part of uh, recreation. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. We're going to open up the floor to a couple short questions and answers. And if we can't answer it, we'll point you to the professional that can. We are going to be releasing a lot of information within the next couple days, every one of us. But what I want to say is two things that I began with. Number one, knowledge is power. There's a lot of information shared tonight. And the second thing I want to tell you is that our role is to represent you. We're not that concerned with making believe we're wonderful for two hours and we're going to ribbon cutting or having a big dinner and applauding for one another. We're here to serve. We serve you. We do return our phone calls and we are here for you. And look at the group of people we have that are like-minded and not going to accept the same old, same old. Okay, so if anybody would like to um, ask a question, please go to the podium. You don't have to state your name, but fire away. We have a few minutes, and there's more pastries, water, and coffee, too, by the way. <laughs> okay, anybody have any questions or comments? I have a comment, Ace, before somebody does have a question. Somebody's just the, coming up. Yes, sir, Mayor. Just the services that the county provides, um, Erica, the whole... I mean, those are all free of charge, right? So everybody is aware of that as well. Thank you. Good point. And you'll notice, too, what we do, and it's a conscious decision and effort, is we don't recommend for-profit agencies or companies. They may be wonderful, but that's not what we do. We have so many incredible services that are free and so many beautiful people that are selfless. That's always our first line. And Sheriff Gan besides this crew, Sheriff Gannon is always our first phone call. So thank you guys, we really appreciate you. And I think we have a dear friend of ours approaching the podium. Hi, my name is Christina, I live in Hanover. I'm a long, uh, long life resident of Hanover. Um, I think tonight's phenomenal. I love seeing all the different towns here to represent. I think that is a tremendous value that ACE has brought to our town. And the only thing I'd like to say after the amazing presentations and all the information, <coughs> I don't know if there is any action being taken on the causes of the mental illness. Like I have opinions on what that is and a lot of it has to do with social media, cell phones, uh, parental controls not being um, manufacturers with parental controls on them to protect our children. Um, so I'd love to see a presentation on that and um, also in our schools provide presentations to parents to help them navigate this world of electronics. Um, I worry about my own children. I have three. And um, I'm just curious if we're going to address the cause of the mental illness. We know how to support it. Um, I just want to get to the cause of it so we can hopefully reduce the numbers. That's all I wanted to share. A good topic. Thank you. Tracy, you want to take a swing at that? Yeah, so we're actually providing, the Mental Health Association's actually providing a social media um, presentation for parents. I don't have the date off the top of my head, but if you want to come see me after, I could give you my information um, and contact you and let you know. Thank you. Tracy, I would love for you and Christina to connect. Wonderful, That would yeah. be great. Thank you. Anyone else? 
Mayor, this is just an observ observation to kind of follow up with that question. And um, I mean, I just see it, and I think it also comes with being, um, you know, a county like Morris County that's, that's pretty wealthy. We have phenomenal schools. I mean, the pressure on the kids, social media aside, um, I saw this, you know, raising my children, the competitiveness and the, and the you know, the need to get into the best school and to get best grades. And the, I mean, it's, that's very, very, we can be very, very tough on our children in that respect. Yeah. Yes, sir. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Well, my name is Michael D'Archangel. I'm a resident of East Hanover. I also work for the Somerset County Department of Health. Um, Hope One um, is a great program of all the services that you provide. My question is, um, do you have any plans to open a Somerset County chapter? I think you guys would be beneficial down there as well. We do volunteer opportunities at the health department, and we do have care nurses on staff to provide mental health assistance as well. Uh, are there any plans to open a chapter down there? I think we can absolutely work with uh, their local law enforcement. We would be interested. Uh, we've had sheriff's departments open it. We've had uh, prosecutor's office headed up, and then we've also had human services headed up. So throughout the state, it's ran differently in each county. So I think it's something we can definitely work together on. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? So everyone, before we close, I'd like to ask anyone on the panel if they'd like to have a closing thought or comment before we adjourn. Uh, starting with... Kathy Weddy, would you like to say something? Anybody? No, it's just <laughs> quite an honor to be uh, here with everybody. And uh, it's, it's, it's exciting to be part of uh, this group. Thank you. Thank you. Lucy, you good? Ace, to quote you, knowledge is power. And the more informed we become, the better advocates we can be, not only for ourselves, but the people we love. Thanks. Chief Jack. Ace, you summed it up before. We're here for you guys. We're here for your families. Thank you. Mayor. I'm not one for not having a, something to say. <laughs> <laughs> I, I got to tell you, um, I didn't know what to expect uh, on a mental health um, supposedly, you know, to, to sit here and listen to all the agencies. And my hat's off to what you're doing, Mayor. And all your mayor, all the mayors sitting up here, and all the professionals, because really, mental health is a, is a huge issue, um, and and I just am really impressed and very grateful that you reached out and invited me. And I've been mayor 14 years in Marstown, and this mayor of Hanover has now reached out so many times to invite me to different things. Uh, I am just very grateful for your friendship and for your leadership. Thank you, Mayor. Appreciate that. Thank you. So, <laughs> in, in closing, there's something that I always like to say when I'm finished in a what I call a successful evening and great understanding of who we are and what we want. And this is what I always end with, and it comes from the heart, that we may not be related by blood, but we are related by community. And community makes us family. And family takes care of family. And that's exactly what we want to do. And in ending, may the grace of God touch all of our hearts and make us all better people and help the people that are in need of help. God bless. There you go. I just want to take a minute to thank somebody that's not on the panel with us tonight, but is out there every day fighting a good fight, and he's a dear friend, and he's an important part of Hanover Township. Hanover Township Deputy Mayor Mike Mahalko. Mike, you're something else. You're in the trenches every day. Would you like to make a closing comment? You guys summed it up very well. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, okay, thank you, Mike. My, my closing comment would simply be, uh, this is not a one and done. We are here. We are here for you. When we ask you to support us when we run for elections, again, it's not so we feel wonderful for a little while. 
it's so we can get to work. It is public service. I have some incred incredible friends and mentors up here. I refer to Mayor Padula as my brother and my mentor, uh, and it's real. And we are going to be doing this every two and a half to three months. Our next stop is going to be East Hanover. The following stop is Morris Plains with, with Mayor Carr. Uh, we will be videoing every, every um, symposium, and we will also be cutting it into different pieces. Because like I'm, I watch YouTube every night before I go to sleep, and if something's nine minutes, I'm going to watch it. If it's an hour and ten, I might not. So we're going to cut it up into pieces, and uh, we're going to make sure everybody gets every piece of information they'd like to get. And and again, like the mayor said, and now and Chief Jack said, knowledge is power. We have to learn. We have to fight. And I used to say, even when I was a little kid, if I go down, I'm going down swinging. And uh, I want to learn. I know we all want to learn, but we're here for each other. Mayor Taylor. Boys, I'm uh, uh, proud and, and uh, honored to be up here as well. I, I think that we need to reach out to more communities throughout the state and do this exact thing to help our, our children and to help our adults or, or and our aging adults as well. Uh, you know, family history is family history. I've told my story. Come on. Family history is amongst all of us with drugs, alcohol, and, uh, and issues with uh, suic teen, su teen suicide and adult suicide. So I have a very extensive family history of uh, drugs and alcohol of an elder brother of mine who passed away at age 57 from a lifelong addiction of heroin. Um, he uh, was nor uh, NA and AA for about 14 years of his life, which were great years with him. And he lapsed back into uh, what became uh, the death of him at an early age of 57. So uh, I just say that everyone here knows somebody, and we're here to help if we can. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor Carr. Um, I think we've touched on a large uh, scope of, of topics here from uh, younger ages right to the most seasoned of our residents and um, one thing I can say is take advantage of everything that's here and that was offered to you uh, whether it comes out online these packages that are here talk to some of the people that are here but utilize everything that was here and given to you um, like I said before we do this because we care and uh, we really do truly honestly want to help so take advantage call look online, get some numbers, take some cards, take a bag, but get it to the right people that, uh, that really need help. So this, is, this is great, and we're very proud to be part of it. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. <laughs> Commissioner Shaw. Thank you, Mayor. I've lived in Morris County just about my entire life. Um, grew up here, raised two <laughs> children. Um, I had no idea the services available on the county level until I was a freeholder elect and the administrator took me around for three days to look at all the offices and agencies in the county. Um, so like the mayor just said here, uh, you know, they're, they're there for the residents of Morris County and they're free. So avail yourself of them. And on another related note, uh, the county works, as do most of our towns, with tons of volunteers. So just in the area of that we've been talking about tonight, we have eight advisory boards. Um, we're always looking for volunteers to appoint those advisory boards. Veteran services, aging, maps, uh, workforce development, just to name a few. So I'm going to make a pitch out there. If anybody is interested, I've got business cards here with my cell phone and my county email address. If you think you, there might be an uh, advisory board you want to, there's no compensation. Um, usually meet about once a month, but it's very fulfilling work, and we always need volunteers. So I'll close with that. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. <laughs> Tracy. So I want to thank you, Ace, and everyone who came today to talk about such an important topic. Um, and our hope is the more we talk about it, the more we could reduce that stigma surrounding it and allow people to reach out for help that are struggling and also to give people the tools to reach out to someone that they think is struggling. So thank you again. Thank you. Denise Brennan. Last but not least. Last, Last but not least. <laughs> Well, I was thinking about something that Kathy had said about asking for help and being in counseling, and we had some family counseling when my kids were young, 
and uh, the counselor said, uh, you're the parent, and adolescence is, is a roller coaster ride, and your job at the, as a parent is to stay on the platform, not get on the ride. You're not supposed to do the ups and the downs, and I'm thinking, well, I'm Italian, I have to run the train, how can I stay on the platform? But I think with all these issues, that's the kind of thing is, that's how I see our role. We're going to kind of sit back and then see what needs to be done and then go out and help. And so uh, if we could do it through recreation, through Hope One, through all the, the, the various uh, uh, agencies and uh, activities that are available, uh, as somebody said, take advantage of it. Take advantage of everything. And if you have ideas, bring them forward because that's how things, new ideas, this was a new idea, and, and look how beautifully it's played out. So uh, be part of the solution. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Have a great night. Thank you all.